Hello everyone and welcome back to the Stephen King podcast. It's been a while. It's been almost a month and a half since the last podcast went up. We are sorry about that, but things happen in real life that makes you have to do other things than having fun about Stephen King. But we are back and Lou is with me. Hello, Lou. Hello, everyone. Yes, sorry for the delay. The life definitely got in the way for both of us. So, And even yesterday was a bit of a last-minute drama for me because I got some spyware on my PC and I basically had to rebuild it yesterday and get it ready for today's podcast. And I got to say, Windows 10 makes it a lot easier to do that. <laughs> yeah. Goodness. yeah, but now we are back and we have a full episode for you. First, I want to mention that the, the contest we had in the last episode with George Beam and his new book... All the winners should be having their books. If you don't have them already when you listen to this, you should have them pretty soon. Uh, once again, real life came in between and George ended up being extremely busy with his, his real life, we can say. Uh, the one that paid, pays the bills. So he sent the books earlier this week. So if you're in the US, you should have them when this podcast is out. And if you're in Europe, you might want to give it it, it usually takes about a week, a week and a half for, for stuff from the U.S. to arrive in Europe. It, it has been sent, so it should be with you uh, shortly. Awesome. Yeah. And today we have a full episode. We're going to give you the news. We're going to give you two reviews uh, mm -hmm. for the price of one. <laughs> See, we feel uh, guilty about being away for so long. <laughs> yeah, um, I wish we wish we would have put uh, choose uh, happier stuff to review, though. But the things we're going to review is Graveyard Shift and Under the Dome, uh, the wrap up. If you remember that uh, TV show that aired some time ago, and after that, we're also going to talk about adaptations of King's work that hasn't really taken off. That's in some different state, some of them are just in script state, while others are almost complete. So we're going to talk about those and when we may be able to see any of those, if ever. Mm -hmm. Appropriately, um, they're all in hell. Development hell. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a full episode for you today, but as usual, we're going to start with the news. Welcome, welcome. Do not fear the door that lies before you. We will protect you. We are your guides, Hans and Lou, and we will give you the latest in Stephen King news. But before we do so, you must prove yourself worthy. You must open the door and join us in the death room. That's right, and off the top, we're talking about books, lots of books actually, 27 to be exact. Scribner, whose king went to after he was with Simon & Schuster, they have acquired the rights to his open market print books, his ebooks, as well as his audio book rights to 27 titles. And you can go to Han's site, look for the October the 14th entry, and it lists all the books there. So anything from basically Wizard and Glass back is included in that and though i see this is an is this an alph this is an alphabetical order is it looks like it yeah so anything from what would that be 1982 or 80 some, somewhere around there i think wizard and glass is the last dark tower book or wastelands to wizard and glass so wizard and glass was the last dark tower book that was pr printed by the previous publisher anyhow scribner's uh, got the rights to them so i imagine we're going to be see repackaging uh, and re-releases of all these books but they're all under the one umbrella now which is good yeah yeah that's really great and uh, as you say i think we're going to see a lot more republishing of the books now uh, and maybe i don't know if all of them are released in as out audiobooks uh, mm -hmm. If not, I'm guessing we might see a lot of those popping up as well. 
Okay, and uh, the next news is also about a book, and uh, this is about an upcoming book, the third book about Bill Hodges. And this is the third book following Mr. Mercedes and Finders Keepers. And we have gotten a second description of the plot for the book. And before I read it, I'm, I want to say that it is spoilers for the books uh, ahead. Uh, well, sorry, before uh, Mr. Mercedes and Finders Keepers. If you haven't read those, you should maybe cover your ears for a little while. Anyway, I'm going to just read what it says here. End of Watch is a compelling and chilling suspense novel which sees retired detective Bill Hodges back on the trail of his nemesis Bradley Hartsfeld, the criminal the press called the Mercedes Killer. Foiled in an, his attempt to commit a second mass murder, Hartsfeld is confined to a hospital brain injury unit in a seemingly unresponsive state. But all is not what it seems. Bradley is able to influence both his physician and the hospital librarian to com commit crimes in the outside world. Now the technological genius has created a hypnotic electronic fishing game which compels users to commit suicide. And he is determined to target three people who put him in the hospital, Hodges and his sidekicks Holly and Jerome. Then he plans to initiate a suicide epidemic. For Hodges and the city, the clock is ticking in unexpected ways. Both a standalone novel and the final episode in the Hodges trilogy. End of Watch is a tense read which takes the series into a powerful new dimension. So, what do you think about that? Well, I'm kind of surprised that they lay it out that plainly. <laughs> yeah. I, I think they could have withheld off some of that. I can understand why some people would be a little upset to read that description because to me, unless there's a, another level that's not in this blurb, it's really laying out the plot a little too much for my liking. I mean, it, it doesn't it's, it doesn't spoil the book for me, but I think I would have preferred to find out some of these things myself. But And I go back to when we previously talked about when we got the first description of the book, I was really surprised. And I was surprised in the, the second book as well, Finders Keepers, that he added that psychic element to yeah. the story so that really got me excited and and this is description even if i think it's a, maybe a little de too detailed has really got me jacked up about this next book which i think should be really really exciting yeah yeah i agree and uh, i'm also a bit su uh, surprised that he's taking it in the direction that uh, it's a more supernatural thing because mr mercedes was uh, all but supernatural it was more suspense uh, thriller mm -hmm. and uh, I've heard some complaints that that some readers are a bit unhappy with this turn that it, that he added the psychic element yeah oh okay yeah yeah I could see that because he promoted it at, from the beginning as a straight-up detective series so yeah yeah I can, I can think that not that I dislike the way the book is going but I don't think maybe that it would have been necessary to do it here I think he could have used these three books and not have some something strange happening that in that way more realistic uh, if you want to i think that would have been interesting to see how that would have turned out yeah but on the other hand then then i guess the third book would be totally different from what yeah. it's and, what it and, is now and, so and the, and the cool thing about this is normally we don't get this backstory of characters until they get into a, a scenario like this like Maybe the Dead Zone kind of does it, but it's a smaller book. But here we've got two books worth of investment in these characters. So yeah. whatever happens in the third book, I think it's going to be amped up just that bit more because we've already got this emotion, emotional attachment to these characters. So, yeah. But I, I'm happy. I, I'm just surprised that he's yeah. added this element. But I can understand other people why they would be upset yeah. or disappointed. Yeah, I, I really like the first two books, so uh, I'm, I'm sure yeah. I'm going to like this one as well because I think the characters are, are the main focus, and I, and I I really enjoy enjoy them. Yeah. All right. Yeah, and the book is out uh, this summer. We can mention that as well. Uh, next, ne yeah, this summer or, or next summer. <laughs> yeah. You, we're not in the next year yet. <laughs> and, no. and that's is that the only book that's on the schedule so far for next yeah. year? Wow. Yeah, I, I think that that's actually the only book we know about. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, I'm hoping that we're starting to we're going to get a tease about something else soon because I do understand that he is working on something else. But yeah, I think the that's well, no no uh, details have been forthcoming yet. So no no. But again, 
we're greedy. You know, we want more. <laughs> yep, yep. We want one book released and uh, know about three more. Then That's we're right. Happy. Yep. <laughs> exactly. All right. Yep. Turning to TV, there's a couple of linked posts here for 11.22.63, which has had its premiere date announced for on Hulu. And that yep. will be on February 15th. And as well, a trailer is uh, available for the series. And February 15th just happens to be President's Day uh, in the States. So that's an understandable and a cl I guess a clever bit of marketing that they've released it that way. Yeah. And yeah. the trailer is out too. And you can check it out at Han's site. Look at for his November 19th posting. With, it has a link to it. Uh, what do you think of the trailer, Hans? I think it was interesting. It, I think it, it, it catched what the book was about or the story is about. Mm -hmm. uh, without giving away too much, yeah. uh, but still giving you an idea of, of what it's what it's all about. Right. Uh, and I, I have a good feeling about this one. And I know I said that when Under the Dome was being made as well, but <laughs> I, <laughs> I think this one will be different. Yeah, uh, I, I, I don't know how much they've spent on this series, but from that trailer, it, it really looked more like a movie than a TV series. I found it very cinematic. Yeah. And I love the setup shot with the main character looking to the hallway, where which is the portal. And off camera, you, you can't see him as uh, Chris Cooper, who's playing the restaurant owner, a diner owner, telling James Franco's character what, what this this is really a portal. So I thought that was really nicely set up. And the pullback shot from the long, long dark hallway. And again, I just thought everything, every shot that we saw in here looks very cinematic. They looks like they put a lot of money on the screen to get really get the time period to, to feel authentic in that. And you've had a lot of pictures up on your site in general, just showing all yeah. the different cars and things like that. So, yeah, I'm 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 very hopeful for this as well. Yeah, and and as you as you mentioned, just uh, the portal looks very promising in the in, in the trailer, mm -hmm. uh, and I think that is one of the things they need to get right because I think. The fact that he goes into a kind of closet and ends up in in the past mm -hmm. could be extremely ex extremely good or extremely bad. <laughs> so, yeah. And I think that can 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 really if if it's done bad, I think it could affect the the following episodes as well. Mm -hmm. And if it's done good, that you really buy that that he is going in there and, and traveling back in time. I think that could could also uh, have effect on on what's happening next. So I think that's an important thing that they have to get right. A portal a, a, a portal into the past is not that difficult to do from a special effects point of view. I mean, we've seen stuff like this from the Time Tunnel and even Star Trek on the City Edge of Forever. So yeah. technically, I don't think it's it's going to be ex an expensive effect or anything like that. He, I don't know how they're going to make him appear at the other end if he just sort of shows up, uh, becomes like a ghost that gets more solid or if he just pops out of thin air. I, I don't know how they're going to play that. But the actual implementation of how it works in the story, much like a King's book, he just really didn't explain it. And it's something yeah. that it's people will just sort of accept that. I mean, because we've seen that it, it's to me, it's a lot different. Like, I don't know if you've seen Jurassic World yet. Yeah. But, yeah. but they have that that whole sequence with the character who's trained these raptors. But they don't mm -hmm. explain how he did it. And because, yeah. <laughs> so you just kind of have to take it on faith. But it, it's kind of like, well, how did you train these things in the first place? Like, I, I mean, <laughs> you just showed them your hand and that's all it took. Like, that's basically what the impression you got from them, right? Which, yeah. if you know, like raptors, like these are wild, crazy beasts. That's something that has to, to me, has to be explained. Because I was sitting there like, the, for the, you know, once they showed that, even though the rest of the movie was going, I still kept coming back to, well, how did he train them? Like, what did he do? Like, it's just, yeah. Yeah. you know, it doesn't didn't make any sense. Whereas with a time portal thing you just kind of do, use it and it's done with and people will just accept it but so, so it, yeah. to me it doesn't the worst thing they could do is really try to over explain how it works it's just it's just there and he you you just use it and that's all there is to it yeah yeah i think i think in the book is is coming out through a door uh, or something like a, that yeah yeah it's like in, but we in, don't know uh, how they're going to handle that in the, in the series no but, um, no but but it's it's the simplest way. If he walks into a door and then appear in a door, yep, and it 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 would be much better than if he just uh, appears from thin air mm. like a ghost. Yep. Yep. Well, it's uh, exciting, and I guess we'll know in what about three three months. Yeah, hard Something to believe. Like that. Yep, it's hard to believe. Yep. Okay, moving on. And the next thing is also a movie, uh, or maybe two, or whatever they decide to do. It's the It a movie. And the news now is that it's going to start filming next summer. 
and we don't know really much about it, but it says the shooting is set to take place next summer. Uh, and that is mainly to be allowed to work with the children. Uh, and I, I guess that is because they have a, like a summer uh, holiday from school, I guess. Yeah, well, they, otherwise they'd have to have to be tutored on set and that, and that elongates the, work, the shooting schedule because they can only work like so many hours a day. Yeah, yeah. Without, and they uh, still have to, have to do schooling, so. Yep. So Andy uh, Muschet- Muschetti? Muschetti, yeah, like a knife. Muschetti? Yeah. Yeah, machete. Sounds good to me, machete. <laughs> yep. Is <laughs> uh, the director and producer and uh, we will see what he can do with it and we haven't heard anything more, no casting news. No, uh, except that Will Poulter is still in the mix to be Pennywise. Yeah, but I don't know if that was ever confirmed that he actually was it or if it was no, just no, a, a was rumor just, or a wishful thinking. I think he was just considered yeah. and and the machete says he's at the top of his list to, to play it so um yeah. I think that would yeah. be interesting it's still not clear if he's if this is being done as two movies or not though no i think i read somewhere else that they want to do it like two movies i hope uh, so that would be cool yeah but i guess we won't know until until they start shooting i guess yeah or we get some follow-up reports but uh yeah, yeah that would yeah. be cool so yeah, well, fingers crossed on that one. Yep. We don't know how much the script has changed from Fukunaga's original vision of it as well. So we'll just have to see how that plays out. Yep. All right. And here's some disturbing news that I guess we but have already suspected since it's it was something that was worked on quite a while ago and, and was finished quite a while ago. But it's it seems that Cell has no signal. And it has no... The film adaptation of the book has not been able to find a distributor. So yep. what that means is several it's things. It's just laying on the shelf. Uh, it's just laying dust, on the shelf. <laughs> it's surprising that a book or a, a movie about zombies or a type of zombies can't sell, especially when it's got Stephen yeah. King's name on it. I mean, does this mean that the movie is that bad or... Yeah, I mean, I mean, you have you have zombies, you have Stephen King, you have Samuel L. Jackson, you have John Cusack. John Cusack. I mean, four things that should should make a lot of people interested in this movie. So I don't know. It it, it sounds like it's a really really bad movie. <laughs> yeah, which is but, too, too bad. Like, I have to think yeah. at some point this will end up on a, some sort of streaming service like Netflix or Hulu or something like that. Um, yeah, yeah, probably will. I can't unless they uh, they want to maybe they have to write it off first and then once they've done that then they can try to distribute it via streaming or maybe they just want to wait a year or two and see if they can get somebody to distribute it but yeah it's kind yeah. of disappointing to to say the least I think it was the same with Forty New Eight yeah I think that one was also was laying around a long time before it actually was released I think it was that one I I, I don't remember exactly but I know there was another movie that laid around for a long time. Anyway, this news actually comes directly from Clarius Entertainment, who had the rights for it, who I emailed we with uh, occasionally to try to find uh, out when it would be released. And uh, the last time I asked, they commented with that they no longer have the, the rights for it and didn't know who did. Oh. So, yep. So, yes, Cell has no signal. Yes. Has no carrier. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. I'm stopping with the bad puns. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, the last news is actually about the play that I I almost got to see it. What what play? Uh, it it's uh, the Misery version. Oh, okay. That uh, is playing in New York City. Mm-hmm. That has Bruce Willis and Laurie Metcalf in the lead. I was actually in New York when this one premiered, but the only available seats were bad seats, and they wanted like. I think it was just over three hundred dollars for a ticket. Wow! Even though I would like to see it, uh, I I didn't think it would be worth that much. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I passed on it, and now when I did, I'm actually kind of glad I did. Um, <laughs> Roy Brune, a reader of my site who lives in the UK, was actually also in New York and watched it. You can you can read the entire line. Uh, sorry, the entire text he wrote about it on my site but if I'm gonna tell you a little short about it here he wasn't happy with it he liked the sets you can also see images on of on my sites and it looks really cool both outside and and uh, we've seen some other pictures from inside but he was very unhappy with the Bruce Willis and didn't really like 
what he did with uh, Paul Sheldon, and it's from times to times almost played out like a comedy mm. uh, and that is never good when you do want to do something scary so right he was very unhappy with it and i guess he wished he would spend his money on something else right but that is very very unsatisfying to hear i think yes and i read some someone else comment that they had seen it and bruce willis appeared to get it, get his line uh, fed to him from i don't know the proper name of the i, I guess there's a person in the floor somewhere, right. having the lines if they forget it. Mm -hmm. It appeared that while well, this person were, yeah, it's actually in the comments uh, from the site here. I'm reading it now. Uh, apparently, Willis can't be bothered to learn his line and has them fed to him through an earpiece. Ah, okay. Mm. So actually, has, he seems to have an earpiece in some some of the shows. I don't know if they, that's. Every show, but anyway, anyway, this one seems to have been contrary to what we hoped for, but not a success. And yeah. uh, I think that maybe if you want to see it, you should should try to get it soon because if it if it really is this bad, it probably won't last long. No, I was just looking at the uh, theater site while you were talking, and apparently it's booked through until about the middle of February. But based mm -hmm. on the reviews, I'd be surprised if it lasted that long. But yeah. I don't know. If, I don't know if they're committed to that or not. But it's real puzzling. Why would Bruce Willis put himself out for a live production of something if he's not interested in doing it? Like it does, yeah. that doesn't. It's obviously not for the money. No, no. So why would he not be invested in doing as the best job that he could do? It's yeah. very, very strange. It's obviously a big disappointment to all of us, uh, even for the ones of us that can't go. We were hoping that maybe some sort of a video version of this would get released. But from the sounds of it, it's it's not worth even doing that. So no. And I actually, I tried to get press, press access to go and see it when I was there. Mm -hmm. uh, but they weren't allowing that. So, mm -hmm. and that to me is always a, a warning, warning yeah. bell that when, when, when people don't want you to see their work, yeah. uh, they aren't very proud of it. So. Mm. That that's strange, I think. Yeah, I guess they would just figure that they don't want any bad press. They just want to run out the string as long as they can before the sales get bad enough that they have to cancel it. Yeah. They don't want anybody else to dampen whatever buzz that there is about the play. And if if anyone listening actually go and see it, please let us know how it is. It could be that they hadn't really gotten it together until... At, in the beginning that they needed a, a couple of more tries to get it right so maybe it, it's better now that they have had a couple of shows right uh, so please let us know if you if you go and watch it okay and that is it for the news this is great what's our job we'd like to drive around pick up stiffs or what it's time for reviews from the night shift and up next is the long delayed but promised review of the movie the 1990 movie, uh, Graveyard Shift. And this is based on the short story, which I believe we just recently discussed when we did our Night Shift review, right? Um, yeah, I think we did. We, we did mention the story. And <laughs> um, I, looking at IMDb, I see that it's oh, I've got a 4.7 rating. I'm curious, Hans, what you thought of the movie. Well, um let me give you some some background first. Okay. Um, in in the nineties, when when this one was released, um, the internet wasn't as big as it is now. You didn't know much about it about stuff coming out until they were out. And uh, living in Sweden, we didn't know about it when it came out almost. But if <laughs> we didn't know about it until somebody happened to run over it by accident, so. One day when I was at the video store, uh, I just found this one. I didn't know it was coming. I didn't know it was being made or anything like that. Um, and I thought that uh, the poster for it, I don't know if, if it's the same poster that you had in the US and Canada, but we had uh, the skull with a yellow helmet yep. on it. Yep. Uh, and I thought that was really, really cool. Uh, mm -hmm. So I rented it and I watched it. And... Uh, at that time, I think I, I thought it was an okay movie. Uh, I, w I wasn't as as critical as I am today, maybe. Uh, 
or as spoiled by good things as I was <laughs> am now. Right. Uh, but uh, it was a new Stephen King movie that I didn't know about, and I liked the poster, and uh, so I thought I thought it was pretty cool. Um, then I watched it now for our review, right? And I realized that this is a crappy movie <laughs> with uh, <laughs> crappy actors. <laughs> Whoa! Uh, to- oh. a, to- a totally, totally crazy script, but it still has a nice poster. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> that's my quick review of it <laughs> okay uh, now seri- seriously uh, the, the plot I think it, it doesn't make very much sense at all and I think that's my my main problem with it right uh, and the, the actors uh, most of them are really bad I think uh, at least here uh, some of them have done other things uh, that, was, that has been good but I think here uh, and I, I don't think that it might may it might not be the actors or actresses fault uh, I think that the, their part was written very bad so I, I I really don't want to blame them they are just playing what they're told to be to play uh, I think so but uh, basically I think it's a really crappy movie <laughs> how about you uh... <laughs> I my opinion of it is kinder than yours. I, you know, when we talked about the short story, I said that there was a a part like the the story was working for me until they got to the part where they found the the the, the basement door or the or the trap door to the next level down, and I just couldn't believe that the characters would go into the next level even if that one guy was pissed at the foreman, and the same thing happens in the movie but on a much grander scale because once everybody goes into the next level, it's like all the character development is wiped off off the map and they all start just acting like idiots for the rest of the movie. And it's, it's too bad because like the opening shots with the one guy filling in the machine with, with the cotton and all those rats on the rafters around him, like I don't know how they did that. Uh, I, you know, like they're all lined up. Like, and I yeah. don't know if they had them tied down out of camera or whatever. But I was totally into it. Stapled. Like I, yeah, like I was going, wow, this, you know, this is not as bad as I thought it was going, or bad as I remembered. Like, I thought the opening shots were actually well done, and then the pullback to the cemetery that's outside of the factory, and that I thought that you know that whole opening sequence before the opening credits, I I I was into it. I I, I sure I liked this movie a lot more than the Mangler. And I think that the acting was good up until the point where everything went through, basically just fell through a hole. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Because there's some good actors in here, like uh, David Andrews, who kind of looks like MacGyver, but if he's he's still around, like he does a lot of, he's a character actor. If there's like an evil politician or something like that, that's the kind of the character he plays. Uh, Stephen Macht, who is the foreman, I think yeah. he does a really good main accent uh, in this movie. Actually, I, I yeah, think he, I, I, thought, I give him that. I give him yeah, that. Yeah, he accent. was. I thought he was good. And the the one guy dancing who just kind of lost it and and um, near the uh, you know like once I went through the through the floor and he just lit up his lighter and saw the creature. He's on. Um, if you watch the blacklist, he's playing the the Russian smuggler on that show right now. So it's it's kind of a hoot to see him. And, and I thought Brad Dorif was just awesome. <laughs> <laughs> like he's got the you know he's got his hair back in that ponytail he's got that kind of a cross earring and he's he's just an exterminator but you almost call him the terminator because he's got like all these belt pouches and uh, yeah, yeah. like he, he looks like a warrior like you know like he looks like a commando or something like that so i i was actually digging the movie uh for the most part i mean it's <laughs> the setting is very depressing and then and there's not a character in it that you can really like and and the and the big problem with the movie is the david andrews character john hall we don't learn it we we never learn anything about this guy except that he went to college <laughs> and that he's and that he's apparently running or drifting from something but so but we never get into his head like we don't know what he's about and no. it's like david andrews is playing his version of clint eastwood in this movie the man with no name so um that really makes it hard to get into the movie but i i was digging it up until they fell through the floor and i thought the creature effects were really well done. I thought that creatures kind of looked like something from one of the alien movies a little bit. So I, I was I was digging it. I, I think it's 
I, I like this movie better than uh, The Mangler by by quite a large margin. I, I see it's only got like a 4.7 on IMDb. I, I would probably give it maybe like a 6, a generous 6, because I think it does take too long. The biggest The biggest problem for this movie is it takes too long to get to that lower level. So like you're almost two-thirds of the way into the movie before you get there. And once you're in there, then unfortunately it just really goes off the rails and all the characters just start acting totally retarded. Yeah. Uh, which is too bad because uh, I I was like, this movie, at least the director knew how to set up suspenseful shots and things like that. Like um, like we complained about in The Good Marriage when that director had no idea of how to set up a scene to make the, the to make their, um, have a feeling of tension. I, I thought this movie had that. Um, and from a technical perspective, I didn't think it looked cheap. I didn't think the creature looked cheap. I thought it looked pretty good. So I, but unfortunately, that whole section from the guy, the, you know, the time the guy arrives until they actually get go through that lower level, it just took too long. Uh, it, the yeah. story needed to be much quicker paced, and to get to that part of the story sooner. And then it should have been written a totally different once they went below on that next level. But uh, I, I was maybe I was just in a good mood when I watched it, but I hadn't seen it in a long time, and I actually thought that this was a fairly, you know, decent, creepy kind of movie. Yeah, we can agree that we disagree about it. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Um, I think I think that um, the rat when I saw it, uh, I, it it kind of reminded me of one of those. Uh, candy rats, you know, that's mm-hmm. in, in different col- colors. Right. But this one was hairy. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, slimy, <laughs> actually. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, one thing that I, I didn't like was that I, I didn't really get why they were hosing down the place with water and uh, what their plan was. Because if, if you have like a fire hose and just pour water in it uh, and they poured it on the furniture and and everything. And uh, if if that was to get the rats out, I mean, they they basically destroyed everything else as well. So mm-hmm. it it didn't really make sense why they would do that. Well, I, I think I think mostly it was because they knew there were so many rats down there, so they just wanted to you know try to flush them out. But uh, in general, I think they just wanted to hold the whole thing down anyhow because it was so dirty too, right? So yeah, uh, and I, I had to laugh at the beginning when. Uh, uh, Brad Doris character, uh, the Undertaker, which sounds or the Exterminator, which almost sounds like a wrestler or something like that. Uh, yep. When he stuck that pipe, that hose down the roof pipe, and then all these rats yeah. started coming out of the machine. <laughs> I was going like, "What? <laughs> why? Why? Yeah. What? Like, well, how does that work?" <laughs> that was so yeah. silly, but you know, uh, but he he you know he played it so well that like he's got like chewing tobacco and he spits it out and all this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> he starts, God damn! That's going, whoa! Like he, you know, he was kind of like Robert Eglund was in the Mangler. He just sort of, you know, he yeah. played the part to the to the hilt. But I thought the way they got rid of his character was really lame. Yeah, you know, yeah, like that, that coffin sliding on his head. <laughs> that was like, uh, this is the exterminator. If there's anybody in this. Uh, especially with the background story he gave, like they were trying to set him up like kind of like a Quint character from Jaws who talked about surviving that shark thing in the war, right? He should yeah. have he should have met this killer rat and been killed by that rat instead of just having his head uh, bashed in by that sliding coffin thing. Yeah, so, yeah. That was too yeah, bad. I, I, yeah. And I, I think most, uh, and I think this is probably typical for movies in done in late 80s and early 90s that uh, they take everything and they wind it up so it gets extra everything like like uh, the exterminator he was like an exterminator on steroids and yeah yeah i think i think that's uh, everything in the movie was uh, was done like that they exaggerated it all mm-hmm. uh, and uh, well uh what can i say i wasn't very impressed with it yeah <laughs> Well, for me, the biggest problem was, as I said, once I went through the floor of the story, just was, you know, everything that we knew about the characters just kind of went out the door, except for the forum, and he stayed, he was a dick all the way through it, so. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) But, yeah, we didn't learn anything about the the lead, so we never really had a connection or any investment into whether or not he lived, and I don't know why that foreman killed that girl. That, That was kind of weird, too, so, but nothing really made sense once I went through the floor. 
I, I was so pleasantly surprised. Uh, I just thought it was too slow. Uh, unfortunately, yeah. like that middle section really dragged. Like once it, once they went through the floor, I said, "Okay, now we're gonna get, now let's see something, right?" But uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, the special effects were good. Then when the guys were getting chomped on by the monster and whatnot, uh, that one the the one poor guy that stuck his arm in. Uh, got his hand chopped off. I thought that looked pretty good. So uh, I thought the special effects were well done. It's just that it's a very depressing setting and world. And none of these characters, yeah. the, the, the movie didn't make us care for any of these characters. Most of them no. we probably didn't like. And the one character that we're supposed to like, we never learned anything about him. So that, that was too bad. Yeah. Yeah. And, and no matter what happened, they stayed there because they wanted a job. Well, one I guy mean, was smart last to leave. <laughs> yeah. one. <laughs> but the others, they, it didn't matter what happened. They stayed anyway because they needed a job. And I mean, how bad can you need a job when you have a rat like an elephant <laughs> chasing you? I think I think he would uh, uh, offer that job to someone else. So uh, would you recommend this one for, for others to see or? Uh, if you're a, a, a completionist and you want to see every Stephen King movie, then I would say to me, this one wasn't as bad as watching the Mangler, uh, which that one was just stupid. <laughs> yeah. This one was, it has some redeeming qualities to it. Uh, I thought the rats, the, whoever the rat handler was in the movie, I thought that the rats were, they were probably the most interesting characters in the movie. The way they would look at you these characters when they were doing things it was really well done I, I i don't know how he got him to go all on that rafters like that but i thought that was pretty creepy yeah yeah i think if 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 you're a stephen king fan you need to see this movie because if you can sit sit through an episode of under the dome you can definitely sit through this one <laughs> um, <laughs> but if you have seen it you might not have to see it again but it has a very cool poster i think <laughs> So uh, if not, you can you can use that as a background for your computer or something like that. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> and I I agree that it it is better than the Mangler. Okay. That's well, at least we agree best. on that. <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> it's interesting. Uh, we we can we can do that when we do the next review. I have a I have a question for them. For oh for under the dome. Yep. Or, or for the, oh, okay, sure. No, for the dome. I'll save it for them. <laughs> okay, cool. So there yep. you go, folks. I uh, would like to hear for your thoughts on this movie. Uh, it's not easy to find either. No. And I, I think it's only out on DVD. I don't even know if it's on a video. T- I, it must have been on a videotape. I think it, I'm pretty sure I remember seeing it on videotape, but it's, it's a hard yep. DVD to find, that's for sure. Yeah, here in Sweden, it was released on video uh, sometime in the 90s. And, oh, okay. uh, it's actually one of the few movies that hasn't been released on DVD or Blu-ray here. So mm. uh, we have to go to the UK or some other country to get one. All right. Yeah. Okay. So that's our thoughts on Graveyard Shift. Yes. Moving on to Under the Dome. Thank God this show Hallelujah. has... <laughs> yeah, Hallelujah. I want to play Handel's Messiah right now. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> yep. The show has ended. Thank God. And, I, um, I'm going to be right up front and say, this is number one, the worst adaptation of any King material I've ever seen. Yeah. Uh, then, it, it, then this is a good time to ask, ask the question I was going to ask you. Okay. What would you choose... Sitting through the Mangler or an episode of Under the Dome? Well, that's not fair because under uh, an episode of uh, Under the Dome is only half as long as the movie, right? Okay, so I, so I would two I, episodes. I, okay, I would watch the movie again. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yep. Any time of day. Same here. Yeah. So I don't know when. How far did we get last time we talked? But were we even in season three? I think we just sort of. Yeah, I think, I think we general. had just mentioned the first uh, episodes. First three or something like that, right? Yeah. So. so... We want to crazy, to... crazy things happened after that, but unfortunately, crazy things happened every five seconds on this show after that. So they all <laughs> yep. they all became a meaningless jumble of of nothingness. You know, it, it, the show sort of turned into some flavor of invasion of the body snatchers, I guess you could say. And whether it was, and I don't know if I mentioned this the last time we saw this, but I think the creepiest stuff was the stuff with. Um, Mark Helgenberg's character and uh, Junior. I don't know. I just <laughs> yeah. like every time they were in the same room together, I just started to get the creeps all over my body. <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> that was just so bad. And yeah. I think that 
Dean Norris at least had the insight or a read on the show enough to realize that the, it was totally ridiculous because he sort of became like the comedy relief of for the rest of the series but boy oh boy i i'll leave all that discussion about where that's the, how the show ended to the end but man there was some ridiculous stuff in here and i again if you're interested in telling stories or writing or anything like that this is a textbook show on what to watch on not how not to write for a good story because it does it doesn't establish hardly anything you, they'll tell you one thing one episode and then the next episode it's just totally ridiculous how it flips 180 degrees depending on what's going on i i just i just cannot fathom the talent that is in front and behind the camera on the show how sloppy it was yeah i, I agree with you and and this third season was it was so bad that uh, I can't really understand how they could do this and still be uh, proud of themselves. Um, as you say, everything just fell apart and one thing was stranger than the others. And uh, something that, that uh, I reflected on, uh, because I, I actually had to uh, fast forward, forward through the last episodes to remember what happened for this podcast. Um, and in the in the intro, it says that uh, four weeks ago a dome dome came up. So everything that's happened here has happened in in four weeks in in a month. Right. Uh, and I mean, if if you think about it, four four weeks uh, when when the show started, Julia's husband was killed by Barbie. Yeah. And four weeks late, later, they are practically married and uh, about yeah. to live their lives together. Yeah, but and, she should still be grieving. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I mean, it, 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 you get the same feeling like, uh, I, I don't watch it often, but sometimes I happen to switch on the channel when, when Big Brother is on. And it's, I don't know if, <laughs> if they are using the same phenomenon as in there, because uh, there it is like this, everything gets uh, exaggerated, like small problems became very big problems because they have nothing else to do. And I don't think I, I think that maybe they wanted to do the same thing here. Uh, that uh, I, I mean, do you forget that your husband has been murdered uh, in four weeks, and do you want to marry the one who did it? And do you go to uh, bed with him like that was what? How many seasons ago now? Two, three? Yeah, so, I mean, just that, basically that like a like, day, like three days after her husband's been murdered, she goes to bed with the guy. Like seriously. Yeah. So it's just so, ridiculous uh, stuff like that. Yeah. And uh, so, so, so much was wrong with this one. Uh, mm. And um, they introduced uh, this new character called Eve, Eva, yeah. uh, who isn't in the book, uh, but that is uh, Barbie and I don't remember her name. Uh, a lady that shows up with, uh, hmm, what's her name? Uh, you mentioned her Christine, earlier. Christine Price, yeah. um, Morgan Helberg's character. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Uh, mm. And first they uh, end up in this cocoon-like thing where they, they, they believe that they are actually free and living in the free world. And in that free world, in their dream world, uh, Barbie and Eva, uh, sorry, and um, Barbie and this woman have a child. And then they wake up and she is not pregnant. And then she's pregnant. So, and then she gets this girl called Eva uh, who... Uh, grows enormously fast and uh, judging by the time that they are living in this dome I guess she's grown up in say three days or something like that mm -hmm. and becomes this evil person who will lead uh, these aliens uh, when they take her over the world yeah so and I mean I can't even describe it to you now without smiling because it's so it's so crazy i mean how how interesting would it have been to be a fly on the wall in that writer's room where they when they come up with this uh, yeah this uh, because i mean this is talented people we're talking about this is people who have have done other shows that have been successful and so i mean it, it's not uh, a couple of amateurs sitting uh, uh, sitting and, and drinking their faces off and coming up with this. This is <laughs> professional screenwriters. Uh, so yeah. I, I don't know how this happened, but it, it's a disaster. 
Yeah. I mean, uh, that, that that's a great example. Another favorite one of mine that I remember from this season is they spend, Julia and spends like a couple of episodes trying to get Barbie to remember that they had a relationship and that they were in love and all this stuff. And he's totally dedicated to this other girl. And she, they're, he's, she's torturing him for like two episodes. And then, I can't remember what, however, he gets out of the chair and he catches up to her by the edge of the dome. And then all of a sudden he falls back in love with her. Like yeah. <laughs> with no, there's no action at that in that scene other than her saying that we used to be in love and he just sort of like all of a sudden it's like somebody hits him with a magic wand and he says oh yes i remember now you're right we used to be in love and it was yeah. like, seriously <laughs> after he just spent two episodes torturing him and he put up such a big fight and wasn't going to change his mind now he just just like like that snap somebody snaps their fingers and now just because the story needs them to be back with uh, Julia so that they can finish off the series they put them back together like that it was just so ridiculous yeah wasn't that explained with uh, that love conquers everything and yeah but why did he have to get tortured and uh, <laughs> and that didn't change his mind like it doesn't make any sense like no, you know I agree. Uh, it was just oh. And she, if she really loved him, would she have done all those things to him? But And then the yeah. ending. Now we can get to the ending with yeah. Joe, quote, sacrifices himself to bring down the dome. Yeah. And then they set up this whole open end where, of course, <laughs> uh um, big uh, big Jim is now like a, I don't know he's a senator or something like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> of course, and Julie and Barbie are uh, just riding around on their motorcycle, camping out. But he calls them all back in because they've discovered the um, another egg or something like that or whatever. Yeah, yeah. They've they've seen the surveillance footage of of Eva. Of Eva, that's what it was. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then then we see a couple of kids sitting in the in the grass playing. Yeah. And Eva comes and say oh come on kids we gotta go and yeah. they say oh we find an egg like you told us to yeah. and there's another egg and which she actually leaves there yeah she leaves it there <laughs> <laughs> so uh <laughs> like cover it up or something like yeah you know, like, like, and, and then we have that whole thing with nori is now in the army and yeah. she just happens to find this be at the same base where where joe surprise surprise is still like alive in a coma or something like that it's yeah, just i think it's yeah, just... and I think that is the uh, is they are trying to tell us that she spent all this time looking for him everywhere yeah. and finally found him, but they are doing yeah. it in like yeah. thirty seconds, so they can't explain it. They just show her <laughs> finding him. But yeah. I wish I could find some some positive things to say about this, but this is just a bag of poo. <laughs> like it is. Yeah. The only yeah, funny stuff is. that I, I enjoyed was uh, Dean Norris as Big Jim having some chuckles. He was always making good remarks about Julia's hair. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're a bag of hair or something like that. Stuff like that. I had to laugh at this. Yeah, he came out with some good lines. Kind of like uh, yeah. Sawyer on Lost, right? He always had nicknames for everybody. So yeah. he, Dean Norris was kind of tapping into that same vein as well. But yeah. good Lord, I, this was such a disappointment. I mean, I'm, yeah. not a, I'm not a super big fan of the book. I think it's okay, but this was so, so off the rails compared to what was going on in the book. And it's just, to me, it just proves that some ideas are not meant to be turned into series. Some things just work better as a miniseries or a movie. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I think definitely that it shows that they shouldn't try to make it something that it ain't. Exactly. Because uh, the problem is, I, I actually like the book. Uh, except for the ending, I didn't really like that. But uh, if, if you, uh, besides that, I, I, I like the book and I like the idea of people being caught on this doom and uh, what that makes of them. Yeah. Uh, so I liked it and I, uh, I had really high hopes for this uh, TV show. But what I think they should have done is they should have done one season, 12 episodes, yeah. follow the book. Uh, what they what they were planning from the beginning to expand this to something much bigger, mm -hmm. and having the dome being up much longer. I don't remember how it long how long it's up there in the book, but I think it's like a week or something like that. Right. Uh, but here they were planning to do something more of it and dragging it out. And yep. and of course, if they're going to drag it out, they're going to have to 
add things and change things to make it work. So I think that if they had decided, much like they are doing with 11.2263 now, that they are doing one season, they are telling the book, they're not changing it, they are telling it, and uh, I, I think then it could have been a great show, because it, I remember the first episodes was, was very beautiful to look at, Mm -hmm. uh, the dome and the the filming and I think it was very very nice filmed and where it was a, a nice show to look at it looked nice but um, no I, I think they treated it totally wrong and uh, they planned to do it turn it into something that it wasn't and mm -hmm. by doing so so they had to change so much that it 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 wasn't really the same anymore so yeah, yeah. and it just there was no logic to it. No. No continuity. People have different. It's it's all subjective. Some people, you know, there. I'm sure there's people out there that like the show and all the power to them. But I, for myself, I just couldn't believe how sloppy it was. And I'm looking at this, and this show gets a 6.8 on uh, IMDb. And mm. to me, this was this was worse than Graveyard Shift. So I, I like I would give yeah. this a five if I was going to rate the whole series overall. So. Yeah. Just ridiculous. That's very generous with a five, I think. I think wow. I would have given it maybe a two or three tops. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, oh, I mean, from a technical perspective and that. Yeah. And some, some of the acting was pretty good and the special effects were decent for the most part. But the writing is what really failed this this show. Or, or, yeah. Or somebody with a clear vision of what they wanted to do. And I know King tries to distance himself from the show, but I think that's a little disingenuous because he did write a, an episode or two um, and had some sort of like small cameos which really doesn't affect the whole direction no. of the show on that but he, he's a little his hands are a little dirtier with this one than they were with some of the other adaptations where he no involvement at all yeah but i think he, even he realized that it, it it didn't work yeah yeah up to so. the end. and uh, i think yeah as you said i think the the most damaging thing was the writing uh, there was no logic, and some of the actors, actor and actresses, were totally miscast, and uh, in my opinion, very bad acting. Mm -hmm. uh, they were very bad at what they were doing. So yeah, I think that I, was I, main. I'm, I'm always hesitant to 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 put too much uh, uh, or be too down on the acting because I, like individually, I think these actors could, you know, in other programs or shows or. Uh, projects, I think they could do, do good work. I, we know Dean Norris can, and we know yeah. uh, Mark Helgenberg. Um, she did good work in China Beach, and uh, she was, you know, CSI. I don't think really stretched her chops that much, but uh, she she was good in that show. Uh, I don't really know the lead actor Mike Vogel that well. Um, I think this no. this is the first thing I've seen him in. Uh, and Julia Shumway, or not Julia Shumway, uh, Rachel Lefebvre. I I have never seen her in anything else, but. I could see her and, you know, like Mackenzie Lentz, who played Nori. Uh, I, I can see them doing other things. Uh, like you probably were most disappointed with uh, Sam, Eddie Cahill, because you said he came from another series that you really liked. So Yeah, yeah. He, he was in uh, CSI New York. Yeah. Uh, and I really liked him there. And I was very happy when he was arriving to this show. Yeah. And, I, and I thought he could, could do something good with it. But... Uh, he 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 just failed here miserably. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, so to it, me, like, if an actor that of a quality of a Dean Norris is struggling with the show, then I really can't put too much of a hurt on the other less experienced actors either. No. No, I guess I'm I, I'm maybe I'm a bit rough on some of them, but um... <laughs> without naming names yes yeah without naming names but i think yeah. uh, some of them are still young and uh, if you go back and, and watch the the big stars of today when they did their first movie i bet they weren't that great either so hopefully this is something they can learn of and um, yeah hopefully they will be strong enough to say no thanks to stuff like this when it appears and keep keep doing good movies instead yeah, and again, it kind of it's like I said in previous podcasts. It's made me retroactively appreci appreciate Haven a bit more, uh, even though I don't yeah. think this last season has been its strongest so far. Uh, I think I'm about two episodes behind, but and we'll we'll talk about that in our next podcast more. But uh, yeah. at least Haven, however goofy it got, it 
was for the most part consistent. At least the the characters were. Uh, so so you can't really you know you have to give them kudos for that. Yeah. Uh, generally, I don't mind if they change stuff from the yeah. book. I know that sometimes they have to do that to Absolutely. make a movie works or TV show works. Yep. But uh, so my main problem with this isn't that they have changed so much. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just want to mention that because it's been a lot of talk about how they changed. And I know King even wrote something on his site that he explained that they had to change uh, the plot some, somewhat because they were going to stretch it out for much longer than the book. And so mm -hmm. they had to change it. So that is not my main concern, even if yeah. some, some of it is, is bad, but that's not my main concern. Yeah. Unfortunately, it's very difficult or it's very rare that you get to do a TV series where you get a clear mandate of, okay, you're going to get four or five seasons to tell your story. I mean, yeah. they, they basically said, let's run with this and see how popular it is. And then we'll go from there. And I'm just surprised that they didn't have a game plan for like, it, it didn't sound like they had a, a game plan for how the series was going to end. No. Because if I, I do not believe that the ending that we got in season three is the one that they had in mind when they first started this project in season one. No, I so, don't think so either. The, the, I, I don't think we got an ending. I think. No, they didn't. They left it, it open it, for a, a sequel. Yeah. And, and the fun thing about that is that when they started this show, they comment that uh, a lot of fans were a bit disappointed with the ending of the book and they were going to do a different and better ending. So they made it sound like they had an ending all planned out, but I don't think they yeah. did. Yeah. Or they had and, and uh, couldn't for some reason do it. All right, okay. let's, put the, let's put the coffin lid on top of this series, please, and move on. <laughs> yeah, and let's never talk about it again. <laughs> uh, that will be easy. <laughs> And it, but uh, should I go here? But King has said himself that he doesn't worry about adaptations of no. of his books because the book is the book and the series is a series. But I, for me, that book will always be tainted by what happened in the series. It'll take a long time for me to get the taste of the series out of my mouth, and I, I don't think I could read the book without thinking about the show and having no. it impact or diminish my enjoyment of the book. Yeah. I agree totally with you about that, but I also want to say that more often than not, I think that they sh should try to make something good of it. Because oh, yeah. if, if they succeed one time and fail eight times, there's still this one that succeeds. So yeah. Um, yeah. I'm happy that they tried, but they should have noticed earlier that this wasn't working. That yeah. that is, I think that is a, a bigger problem than that they actually did it from the beginning. Right. Yeah. All right. So let's put a dome over under the dome and move on. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> So, unfortunately, this has been kind of a downer podcast, and we're ending on a topic that's a bit of a downer, too. Um, and that is about stalled adaptations, or Stephen King works, caught in hell, development hell. How about that? Yeah. <laughs> there is a hell where, <laughs> where stories can go to sometimes. Um, yep. This, this came from an article, uh, and I want to properly credit the writer, Dave Gonzalez, who... Back in September 8th, over at www.geek.com, had 11 Stephen King adaptations caught in development hell. And we just thought that that would be a great way for us to quickly revisit all of these various projects. I think we've talked about almost all of them. Uh, some we never did, and uh, I don't think we really want to. <laughs> We're really sad that we never did either. But uh, there's, you know, there's a couple of projects in here that we really wanted to see come to light and i don't yeah. even think he mentions cell in the list does he i'm scrolling through the article i don't see cell in here so it's actually 12 yeah adaptations yeah, and that we know of there's there might even be more but yep this has always been the case with with uh, or at least for the 20 years soon that i run uh, lilia's library that there's always news about this and that story or book is uh, being turned into a movie and uh, this and this person is uh, connected, is going to do it, uh, and then nothing happens. So so this happens all the time, and I don't know if sometimes I guess the rights are sold, and sometimes they might not be, and so this is always going to happen. Uh, but it's interesting, and, and uh, should we go through the, the list? Sure. Uh, 
Yep, just make some quick comments about each of them. We've already talked about Cell, so yeah, that can be our first one. Yep, so the first one uh, on this list then is uh, a remake of Shield of the Corn. And this was actually done, I think. Uh, yes. They, and, ma they made it, a remake. I don't remember exactly yeah, when it was done, but I know that they did a remake of it. Yeah, and it did terribly. <laughs> yeah, as expected. Yeah. Even uh, though the producer, director said all the right things. Um, yes. Uh, they did they did a TV TV movie actually of it uh, back in 2009 so that might be actually the one that's mentioned here and um, when it, when it comes to Children of the Corn it's I think it's interesting because if you if you watch the the original movie uh, and you I don't exactly remember when it's done but it, it's uh, was it 84 or something like that yeah 84 and I think if if you if you look at it with your uh, 1984 glasses on, uh, I actually think this is a good movie. Looking at it now, uh, some 30 years later, of course, it's going to be a little corny here and there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. I've been thinking about that for a long time. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, but I think that that if if you look at it when it was done, it's uh, it's an okay movie. But then all the sequels are terrible. Yep. And that that has given the first film a bad reputation as well because you talk about it, oh, all those Children of the Corn movies are so bad. Yeah. Uh, but I, th I actually think that the first one is, is an okay movie. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I, I like it too. I mean, uh, you know, it's got a good cast. Again, Linda Hamilton. Uh, I yeah. think she does a pretty good job in here. Uh, it's interesting that this TV version, um, which only got a 3.9, uh, it lists King as a a co-writer of the teleplay. I don't know if that's correct or not. <laughs> uh, I have I have a very hard time <laughs> thinking that is true. <laughs> but th this is all the way back in 2009. So um, yeah, I'm not really sure why this is on the list because that's a uh, long time to. But this could be a totally different version of it. I don't know because this one says yeah. the Weinstein Company, right? Um, yeah. Who, who yeah. did this one? Is this from Weinstein? But I think th this could could actually be the one that's mentioned here that. Uh, this that one is, says Children is. of the Corn Productions, Planet Productions. So I don't know if that's okay. the Weinstein thing or not. So maybe this is another adaptation that they're talking about. But to yeah. me, this this is a <laughs> – I, I hate to use the word <laughs> franchise, but this, this is a series that's had so many misfires that I think it's, nobody should try to do a re, uh, any sort of material related no. to this for like – 20 or 30 years whenever nobody yeah. nobody else remembers the stink of the other ones so yeah i think this this one should be dead in the water because before it's even done so yeah uh, yeah i think that we can we can uh, say that that one we are happy for it, that it's caught in development hell yep all right yeah. next one which would be one i would be interested in seeing is but not a but not a remake of but a, a and a, a new installment would be for Creep Show. Um, yeah, I, I've enjoyed them. And, and again, if you know, uh, I think the first one's the best, especially the crate and the uh, the the one with uh, Eli Wallach, the cockroaches. Yeah, uh, that that one was pretty cool. Uh, the beach one was okay. The second one was so-so. Uh, oh, and the raft too. Even though the special effects mm. kind of killed the ending of that story, um, yeah. And that's one I would like to see redone because I think that's just such a cool story. But I'd like to see a creep show four, um, especially since King has written so many new stories since the last movies came out. Um, yeah, yeah, and 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 I would actually like to see a creep show three because I think that the the creep show three that was done has nothing to do with King, so they yeah. just. Uh, uh, used his uh, used his French fry fr French fries <laughs> his French fries <laughs> 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 to uh, get some attention. Somebody's somebody's hungry. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> so I th I think that uh, they should just pretend that that one was never made and uh, do a, a new th th third movie. Yeah. And uh, of course I agree with you. It, it would be fun to see because I I think that. In in a movie like this, uh, even if it's not called Creepshow or something like that else, but when they do short films of Stephen King's uh, short stories, uh, yeah. I think they they often work very well. So yeah. Yeah. they they don't have to expand them to to last for like an hour and a half. Uh, it's okay if they are just thirty minutes or twenty minutes or 
Yeah. Something like that. So I, I think that that could be an interesting movie to see. Yes. And I think the next story would be a good candidate for creep show for as opposed to a standalone movie. Mm. What do you think? Breathing method. method. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. And I don't know how much this has been planned for real. Yeah, it says back in 2012, Scott Derrickson was going to do it, but now he's attached to Doctor Strange. So we can yeah. assume that this yeah. this movie is dead. And yeah. Different Seasons has four novellas, through three of which have already been filmed. One is a classic. Of course, it's a Shawshank Redemption, my all-time favorite movie. Yeah. Uh, Stand by Me or The Body is also a very, very good movie. Yeah. Uh, Apt Pupil is not a great movie, but it does have a pretty amazing performance by Ian McKellen. Yeah. Uh, but this breathing method is just too much of a story that just relies on a gimmick, really. Like it's it's a punchline to a, to a horror story that uh, there's not enough here to carry a whole movie. Like I, I just don't see unless they totally change it or go, you know use it as a jumping off point for something else. I just don't see how you can make this into a movie. It's more like a half an hour Alfred Hitchcock Twilight Zone kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, this one could work in in like a segment in Creepshow 4 maybe. Yeah. And I don't know how how serious they were in doing this one actually if, mm-hmm. or if it was just because this one often when when uh, there are some substantial in the rumors or uh, words that they are are actually making a movie you often have uh, a couple of news. Uh, something happens, and then something happens, and then it's, it dies down if, it, if nothing happens. But uh, I, I think this might have been the only re- report about it being done. So maybe, maybe they uh, bought the rights to it and, or something like that. But I don't, think, I don't think we should hope too much that it will be done. Yeah, and I personally, I, I don't want to see it turned into a movie because I just don't – no. not there's not enough story there. No, I agree. Yeah, which brings us to our next little trip into development hell, and this one is called the Jaunt, and this is a short story from the Skeleton Crew collection, uh, which was optioned by Brad Pitt, mm-hmm. and interestingly enough, he had targeted the brother and sister in, sister directing team of Andy and Barbara Muschietti, who we know are t- uh, attached to some other project now that we yep. reported on earlier. Uh, it so. Again, this is a uh, this is a story that I don't think uh, on its own has enough meat for a, if they're just going to adapt that that story. But I do think the idea of teleportation going bad is mm. a cool idea for a movie, but it, yeah. it wouldn't have much relationship to the short story. Um, but no, they, this one could also only work as a uh, very short film. If, yeah. if they're going to do it true yeah. to the story. And I think if, if they did a sh- short film like that, it would probably end up in some TV show maybe. Mm-hmm. And then I think this one is too gruesome to be shown on TV. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> not not yeah like traditional TV, but on cable or something yeah. like that, they could do it. But I, I would like, you know, I, this is one where I would be okay with them just taking the core idea of a teleportation going wrong and and creating a whole yeah. movie about it like um you know something like maybe like the event horizon like maybe they teleport into hell or something like that <laughs> i don't know yeah. but but it, or, or, but it could be like you could you know it's kind of like a sliders episode you could do some really cool stuff with this but uh, it wouldn't be it would be it wouldn't be the story that we were familiar with that would be a jumping no. off point yeah okay Next up is and and this one has actually been reported about a couple of times. So I think this yeah. this one is maybe something that will happen, and that is the Overlook Hotel. It's uh, supposed to be based on the prequel to The Shining, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, tell the story of the Overlook Hotel before we get to know it in uh, in The Shining. Yep. Uh, and uh, here we know that Glenn Massara who was the showrunner for The Walking Dead for a while, uh, has been involved, and uh, director Mark Romanek uh, also. So this one has uh, quite a lot of info and quite a lot of names attached to it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so this one may actually happen. It, it hasn't been much said about it in a while. Right. I don't know if I can see when I last heard anything about it. Um uh, 
but I think this one could work actually. And, could work, uh, but do we want it to work? Like I'm not really. It's almost like the prequels for Star Wars. Like we we know we know how through the Shining how the hotel's history came, uh, how it came to be what it is in the Shining. Do we really need to see that made into a movie? I I just I don't know. I'm not really. This one doesn't really excite me at all. If they do it, I mean it's. It's going to tell us a story that we already know the, all the important parts to. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, uh, I agree with you. Yeah. Uh, but still, I think it, if they do it, I don't say that they have to do it, but if they do it, I think it could work. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, but I see that uh, in uh, October 7 of this year, James Vanderbilt uh, talked a bit about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know exactly what he was. Well, his role in all of this is. Um, but there's been some talk about this during this year and last year uh, and the year before. So this one has hung in there. So uh, it, I think it's a little bit more than just a rumor. We'll see. I'm, yep. I, but I, as I said, I'm not, I'm not excited about it, if, even if it does happen. Yeah. But I am excited about... This next uh, project that's not going anywhere is the rumored The Shop TV show, which mm. would be a continuation of the Firestarter series. And um, this was going to be originally or initially done by TNT Network. Uh, we're going to try to create a, a TV show based on a group of people popping up uh, to experiment in Americans. And they might be connected to the Dark Tower series uh, as well. So, yeah. the, you know, there's a lot of potential here. And it would be kind of cool if they could coordinate this series with the Dark Tower series, if that ever gets going. Maybe this could sort of build up, be used to build up interest in the movie series and um, the Dark Tower series, which would be kind of cool. I guess the only problem with this show now or this concept now is there's been so many TV shows on, like Heroes and mm. alphas and that with about people with powers that I think that this this thing has kind of been mined out, especially now that we've got the Heroes Reborn reboot on. Um, I have a feeling that that probably killed any interest in doing this shop TV show. But the shop TV show could be so much more than just about a people with powers. Like, you know, yeah, yeah. they could be into so many other different things. Um, it could become like sort of like the X-Files or something like that. But yeah, I, I see this one as being more about the chop itself than actually the people that they are affecting. Oh, okay. Uh, so I think that would be interesting. And I think they could tie it into Golden Years because the shop is yes. mentioned there as well. Yeah, yeah it would be nice to get some closure <laughs> on that series too. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I think this one could work. Uh, maybe also because we have series like Heroes and the others. Uh, that the fans of those could actually uh, like this one as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I would be interesting to see it focusing uh, more of the shop itself than actually the people that uh, they affect. Of course, it, it has to involve the people they affect as well, but I would like to see that the focus and the starting point is the shop itself, and then we, of course, see a bit about the people they affect as well. But uh, I don't see it as a superhero show where uh, people who can start fires and stuff like that uh, that the show becomes more about them and the shop becomes something in the background mm -hmm. yep. uh, I guess I guess I, I, I don't think this one will be made I don't think so uh, either I hope it would but I don't think so No. and the next one that we had a lot of hope for Yeah. but I don't know it's kind of gone aimless as well yeah the, the stand uh, mm. we haven't heard much about it now since uh, Josh Boone talked about uh, doing four movies yeah um, but we haven't heard heard anything in I don't know when we heard it last it's no, gonna be about the, almost a year uh, I think it was November last year yeah yeah yep. so uh, we don't really know where this one is going um, mm. I think it could work and I know Recently, uh, and I think we men didn't mention this in the news, but uh, there were, uh, I don't know if it, if it was rumors or if it was actually confirmed, but uh, Matthew McConaughey, 
McConaughey. Uh, McCon- <laughs> McConaughey, yep. Yeah. McConaughey. Yeah. The guy from Sorry. Interstellar, you know that guy, or the guy from the Lincoln commercials. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, would be cast as Flag in the new uh, Dark Tower movie or series. I think, and, was, I think uh, it was the stand they were talking about for Dark. Yeah, he, he was mentioned in the yeah, it was mentioned in in the stand as well. But the latest news was that he would, was offered a role in uh, the Dark Tower as well, hmm. and it would be interesting to see him in uh, the role as Flag in both of these. I think so. I think that'd be and, cool. And uh, the Dark Tower. Yeah. So they could could maybe they could hire him for half the price and do the <laughs> double job. <laughs> or, or, or maybe he's going to ask twice as much. I don't know. Yep. Yeah. But yeah, I, th- I, th- maybe. I think, I know, maybe it's a bit of a cliche, but I think it would be kind of cool for the same actor to play both Flag and Roland, because that would be a pretty cool moment, because they never really meet anyhow. Oops, spoiler. Yeah. But um, <laughs> but uh, I go back to that podcast interview that uh, Josh did with Kevin Smith on Hollywood Babylon, and that was yeah. that that podcast the interview got me so excited they're talking about because he totally got the thrust of not just the stand but uh, you know he's talking about Lisey's story this is where I have to take an exception to uh, the, the writer of this article um, what's his name again sorry I have to scroll back up here uh, David Gonzalez he's, he you know said they're talking about turning the stand into four movies and he's got a question mark how uh, it's mm. like does nobody look at the book it's in four parts. <laughs> You know? Yeah, the TV series was done in four parts. It's done in four parts. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's quite easy for this movie, this book, to be done in four movies. I don't remember. I never heard about it being scaled back to two movies, um, and yeah. I definitely don't remember any talk about it being a three-hour movie in an eight-episode miniseries. I wonder if he's mixing the stand or the Dark Tower uh, with the stand. Um, and I think I think there's a bit of confusion there because you know the projects are kind of related because of Randolph Flagg that we're hearing these conflicting reports about McConaughey being offered the role in, as Flagg in one sh- series movie and the f- Roland in the other and vice versa. So mm. really would like to see that four movie yeah. uh, concept come to fruition. But ever since Josh was also attached to that Marvel series of movie, I think it was Marvel or it was DC, but it's a comic book movie that yep. he's very into as well. But from listening to that interview he did with Kevin Smith, I was really pumped for this. And I, I don't know, it's kind of ominous that we haven't heard much about this in, in over a year now. Like, you think there would be some... But they, they didn't they... Oh, the Dark Tower is the one where they made that a statement of uh, 2017 for the release of the first movie. I don't yeah. think we've heard anything about The Stand having a firm no. release date. So No, no. Uh, no, and uh, as you say, it's, it's, it's worrying that we haven't heard about it in... The... In a year, uh, yeah. I think we're going to have to check in with Boone and see if he can. Yes, you're going to have to update us. Yep, yeah. top of the line. Come on, Hans. Yep, yep. <laughs> tell, gonna, us I'm gonna... tell us, us King fans, we're all getting nervous. Yep, I'm going to check with him and see if we can get a statement from him for the next podcast. Yeah. Okay, moving on. Um, the ever in the works talisman. Yeah, uh, this this has probably been in. Development hell longer than any other project, I think. Yes, uh, the book was released in '84, and I remember uh, that they sold the the movie rights to it before the book was released. Yeah. So it's been it's been uh, out there since uh, at least '84. Yeah, Spielberg so, was on it right off the bat. But, yeah. Uh, so that's that's a little more than 30 years. Yeah, I mean he and. Just to give you an idea how long ago uh, this is, Spielberg then went on to film Empire of the Sun. And you know how old that movie is. So <laughs> Yep, yep. <laughs> um, so here we are, 30, 30, 40 years later. Jeez. Yeah. And uh, I have to admit that I, I don't see this one being made, actually. I, I don't think they will ever get it together. I, I think this would actually work better as a TV series, miniseries, like a two-season series or something like that. Yeah, or one yeah and, and there has been, I've read about uh, scripts where Jack was being a girl and uh, oh, yeah. other strange things over the years uh, that people have tried to, to do. Uh, but but I, I don't think this is going to be made. Maybe, maybe if um, King and Scrub write the last book in the series, mm-hmm. 
mm-hmm. uh, the third book, uh, and that's released. And if if that's a huge success, maybe this one will be picked up again and and maybe done. But uh, otherwise, I think it's. Uh, I think that it is hard to make a movie of a book that is so old as this one is. Yeah. Uh, if that book isn't uh, a classic, and of course for us King fans, the Talisman is a classic. But if you if you go to the everyday man who who isn't a uh, just a King fan, I don't mm-hmm. think that a lot of people have a, a strong feeling for the Talisman. So I I think it it might be hard to sell in that they are going to turn this one into a movie just because it's a king book this yeah. far after its its release so yeah i think it can be hard to do this one yeah i i yeah i i don't see this happening unless it's as, uh i don't think it's big enough to be a movie i think it, it would work better as a mini series yeah yeah all moving on and, and yep. this one i i don't think we've ever talked about this or maybe we have hans I don't but think so. Ayanna, um, 2007 short story set in 1982 where uh, a, f- a narr- narrator's father is miraculously curled when, cured when he's kissed by a blind girl named Ayanna. Uh, and then he has to return that miracle favor later on in life. Uh, apparently Universal TV has optioned this uh last february but uh there's no been, been no further word about it and i i don't know how this would work uh i, I gotta be honest i don't remember the story clearly either so uh i don't no. know if this, if this person would be like a on the run kind of a fugitive person or something i don't know like i'm thinking like <laughs> the fugitive or the incredible hulk where they go around doing miracles um and then have yeah. to leave or whatever so i don't know I actually have a little bit of problem remembering that story. Yeah, same here. Uh, it's from just after sunset. Mm. Have hmm. to reread it. Yeah, interesting. Uh, I have to admit that I, I it, it doesn't ring any bells right now. Yeah. Uh, but I think this uh, it's typically they they buy a short story and uh, try to do something with it and nothing happens and yeah. I think I think this one won't be done. Yeah, I, I, I don't see how they can build a, a TV series of this one. No. Alrighty. So okay. now we've got two left, and they're both biggies. If the stand is yep. one of one part of the big three, these are the other two. And the first one is, of course, the Dark Tower series. Yeah. Uh, talked about this endlessly. We now have a director, Nikolai. Link- Why don't you say that, Hans? Because he's from your. Neck of the woods, right? Nikolai Nikolai Arcel. Arcel. So he's a I I think (laughs) that. Yeah. Um, And Sony has put a hard release date of 2017 for this. So. Yeah. um, I I would uh, say that they would have to hurry up. Yeah. So that's why we're maybe we're starting to get these Matthew McConaughey uh, casting announcements. But uh, yeah, I don't know. We've been around the block so many times with this one. Um, But it's. It still still feels inevitable to me that this will be done because Hollywood is dying for f- franchise type of material that they know they can string out over seven, six or seven movies. So um, I think it's going to happen, but I just don't know how what shape or form it's going to take anymore. Yeah, and and the release date is actually January thirteenth, so that means they will have next year to do it. <laughs> uh, to have it released uh, that early. Yeah, so, uh, uh, fortunately for them, except for maybe the last fifteen minutes, the, the you know the the production design for the Gunslinger is pretty minimalistic, so it wouldn't be impossible uh, to have a yeah. movie like this done in, in that time period. Yeah. So we'll see. Uh, I think that it's uh, more likely that it's done than that it's not Mm -hmm. uh, since they released the date and and people seem connected to it Um, so I believe that it will happen but uh, I'm a bit skeptic that they will have have it done by January in 2017 yeah but we'll see 
But hey, I'm glad to see a, a, <laughs> a, commi- yeah, yeah, a commitment. Yeah, I think if they if they do it right, it will be good. Yep. I think. Yep. yep. And the last one uh, we have also already mentioned in news, and that is it. Um, that uh, the latest is that they, they will begin filming this in the upcoming summer. Um, I am still very skeptical about if this one will ever be made. Uh, I think I think there's a bigger chance that we'll see the Dark Tower than that we will see this one. Uh, hmm. But you never know. I don't know. They got directors, so. Yeah, <laughs> they did before as well. I mean, uh, <laughs> the Universal's already put a fair bit of development money into this. You know, they've got the scripts from Fukunaga, so. Yeah. With yeah. some minor tweaking, I guess they're hoping. Um, and if you if we believe what Fukunaga was telling us, it's more a difference in the uh, uh, he wanted it a more uh, main. I think he wanted it more like a, a small country feel, whereas the the the, the 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 studio wanted it more of a, a New York City kind of feel to it, or something like that. Yeah. I think I think it was something along those lines. So um, whether that's a good thing or bad, we'll have to see. But. Uh, it's just a little troubling that somebody else is coming in to handle a project that was a passion work by somebody else. But it's happened before. I think recently, like with Ant Man, was uh, mm-hmm. an, you know initially um, uh, championed by one one director and whose name is unfortunately escaped. You know, he works with Simon Pegg all the time. Um, oh, what's that director's name? I'll have to look it up while you talk about it. But uh, he had a direction for the for the franchise, and it ended up being taken over by somebody else and uh it turned out to be not a bad movie yeah yeah i I actually saw that uh fairly recent and uh, i think it's uh, it's uh it works very very well that movie Mm -hmm. um but we'll see um i i wanted to edgar wright sorry yeah i wanted to add to this uh list of 11 oh that's cheating actually it's 12 12 yeah (laughs) <laughs> um, and I actually have on my site a list of s- stuff that I've written about and uh, a release list. Oh, and okay. there I have a list of stuff that's been uh, reported or rumored to be done, uh, but doesn't have any release date and stuff. So it's it's uh, a similar list to the one we've just gone through. Uh, and this list have been building for almost 20 years so oh, okay. some of this might be very old some of this may, may be new but I, I thought I would go through this okay. just to show you how how much uh, has been rumored mm-hmm. uh, okay uh, Black House The Breeding Method Cell, Children of the Corn Kuju, Eyes to the Dragon Firestarter From a Buick 8, Gerald's Game The Girl Who Loved Tom Gordon Home Delivery, Insomnia, It, Joyland, Last Rung on the Ladder, DC Story, The Long Walk, The Man Who Loved Flower, Maximum Overdrive, The Monkey, One for the Road, Overlock Hotel, Pet Cemetery Remake, Pet Cemetery 3, Quitters Inc., The Reach, Rose Matter, The Running Man 2, Salem Slot, The Stand, Stephen King's The Reaper's Image, Stud City, Sundog, The Talisman, The Ten O'Clock People, and The Things They Left Behind. Uh, and then we have some TV shows. Faithful, The Mist, Mr. Mercedes, Mrs. Todd's Shortcut, New York Times at Bargain Rate, The Shop, and The Tommyknockers. Wow. So, uh, <laughs> mind boggling. That's pretty much uh, every book or story is written. Yeah, pretty well. You might as well just say everything that he's written is up for adaptation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, some of these has obviously been dropped long ago, but uh, it's interesting to see what's been reported as as being uh, bought or planned to do. Yep. Yeah. So we have to take. Uh, Take the new news with with a bit of uh, grain of salt until yes. we know more. So there you go. Hell, development hell is fair, a fairly big place, and I think there's one whole level yeah. just dedicated to Stephen King material. <laughs> yeah. I think it's beginning to get full. A, it must be the tenth the tenth circle of hell, or something. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Or probably we should say the nineteenth, right? Yep. 19th. Yep. 
Yes. All right. Well, that'll wrap up our discussion of uh, Development Hell projects. I uh, hope you guys all enjoyed that. As you can see, there's quite a wealth of material there. Uh, yeah. Once again, we're sorry for the delay between podcasts. Uh, yes. For our next one, we will be looking at uh, the episodes that have aired for Haven so far. Yes. And also, we're going to be covering the first half of the Bazaar of Bad Dreams, right? Yes. Yes. Yes, that will be interesting to see uh, what people think about the, those uh, stories. Yeah, I'm, I'm about three quarters of the way through the book. And I have to say, uh, overall, I've maybe because it's in book form, but I've enjoyed the stories um, a lot more reading them this way than as opposed to finding them in magazines and whatnot. Yeah. Yeah, I, th I, th I think that... Um, uh, with the reservation that it's been quite a while since I read uh, every collection he's released, but I think this one is one of the most uh, even. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that uh, they are all good stories and they are all good. I think that in the others there are some that are weaker. Yeah. Uh, but I think uh, every every story in this one has a high standard. Yes, I agree. Uh, yep. But let's not give away all the goods in this podcast. Nope, nope. <laughs> Start reading the book if you haven't and yeah. uh, join us in the discussion of it in uh, the next podcast. Okay, so yeah. there you go, guys. That's episode 51 in the can. This is a supersized episode. It's almost two double length yep. uh, to make up for the delay between or the gap between the, this one and episode 50. Uh, hope that... Uh, this podcast finds you all and finds you well. And remember, as always, stay scared, but stay safe. All right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think we turned that one around. It's need to stay safe, but stay scared. Well, you know. <laughs> <laughs>